You're on, Alex. Hi, everybody. This is Alex. I'm, I'm back from AIC last weekend up in San Jose, and we've been very, very, very busy um, uh, organizing our summer and all the way into fall with new speakers and things like that. Let me tell you a little bit about that. I'm going to share my screen here. And Eric, in particular, is very proud of the work he's got. He um, <laughs> has been working out in the gym. And uh, he went to twist some arms at AIC, talked to everybody there. And of the uh, 250 people, he got like seven people uh, to, to tell us that he, they'd like to do um, uh, shows for us. And, and that's what we do here. We put on big shows for you guys. So I hope you enjoy it. And here's some of the things we've got coming up. Tonight, Mike and Dave are here. And they're going to be telling us about the generalized hyperbolic stretch script. It's a new, well, for some of us, it's new. For others, they've been using it for a little while and pretty excited about using it. Um, and then next week, we're going to take a little bit of time out to talk about us. You know, I keep calling it a family or a club that you guys come to every Sunday night at 930 Eastern. Um, but yeah, every once in a while, it's good to talk about the family as a family and what happens and how it works and what uh, we have to do to put on the shows for you and what you guys have to do to help put on the shows and how you can participate in it and things like that. We've grown to something like 12,700 subscribers. And while we're proud of that, we're not happy that we're reaching the, all the audience that we could be reaching. But um, that's, you know, that's the kind of thing we're going to talk about. We're going to show you how our programs are doing, where we'd like to go with programs and things like that. That's not the major part of the show. That's a five, 10 minute presentation is, is all. But we think that every once in a while, you, you know, you got to sit back and kind of examine your conscience and, and, and have a self review. Well, that's what we're going to do. And then uh, we're going to have a, a couple of short, tutorials 15 20 minutes each tim's going to do photometric mosaic uh, uh, script tutorial and i'm going to do one a generalized introduction to the concept of back focus and all the way that that uh, all the ways that that word is misused and we're trying to do this to get uh, so we can organize ourselves around some tutorials in the future richard wright comes back the next week after that and i talked to richard he's excited to be back on on the astro imaging channel and he's going to tell us why guiding needs to die and how it's going to happen and then we've got a whole lot of pretty interesting shows fourth of july we're going to take off um guy inez is going to tell us about how to image for free basically uh you know all the money we spend on on uh, software in particular, and some other things. But he's going to show us how we can get around that by using open source materials and stuff. That's pretty interesting. Bob ZEQ is going to come here. He tells us so many things on cloudy nights, and it's about time he showed his face up here and told us a few things. Uh, Warren's coming back. Uh, some of these people, you can see in parentheses, don't have um, actual titles up yet because, um, uh, because Eric hasn't gotten them to me yet. So they don't, but we do have these people scheduled and we've also got September. We've had some, we've sent out offers for some of the people to come in and uh, we're even, we're even going to be good for uh, into October with the people that, that Eric mostly found on um, at the Astro imaging conference or the advanced imaging conference last week. So we are here and I've got to tell you two other things. You notice on September, what is it? 25th. We're doing TAIC shots about the heart of the galaxy. What is the heart of the galaxy? Well, you know, something that down towards Sagittarius A, um, the you know the, the the middle of the um, uh, the the middle of the Milky Way. That's what we want you to focus on. And any kind of picture you want to bring in. And as of right now, we'd like you to have it on uh, this. Um, apparition so sometime between well their summer it's the summer milky way for us down in australia land it's it's the winter milky way maybe but uh please get your best taic shots to us and we'll set them to music and arna will will have a wonderful show for you we heard from rory a little bit earlier in in the in the meeting before we met with you guys here before we opened up the show to the general public and rory has said that we're getting a lot of good responses 
to our current workshop, which is going to be in August 22nd. You need to get these things in here by August 14th. You can go click on this uh, um, icon right here, and you can go get a zip file. And then when you're finished with it, you submit the finished image here. And right now, it's it's actually a full color data set. It's, it's uh, got, um, I don't know, probably 18 or 30. No, it's got like six filters worth of data. And uh, we just like to put, I put the, um, the monochrome one here because I thought it looked cool. But remember, we've got lots of other sample data that you can use and we've used in previous shows. So please download that stuff and work on it and get back to us. Now, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn it over to the guy who got all those speakers for us for the next few months. Eric, you wanted to say something before we got going. Yeah, thanks, Alex. So. Um, well, David and Mike might be too modest to really tell everyone how wonderful this GHS script really is. And uh, so you guys can be modest and I'll be immodest for you. Uh, we all collect lots of data, and then the next thing we do, maybe we do background neutralization and noise reduction, but the real momentous change is when we stretch it. And we can do a histogram transformation, we can do a mass stretch, we can do an arc sign stretch, and they all seem to have you know little flaws in them. And I think that probably all of us struggle a little bit to determine which stretch we actually use. For the last couple of months, uh, for most of my data, I've been using the GHS stretch. And it controls stars and, and keeps it, well, generally keeps things under control so I don't blow anything out and bring everything out in the subtle parts of the, the image that I want. So I would recommend anyone that's listening here pay close attention and give the GHS a stretch. It is my go-to stretching process and i thank mike and david in advance for doing it but i'm sure tonight i'm going to learn a few things and i'm probably doing some things wrong and using it so it's probably going to get even better for me i just wanted to say that before we get going so thank you guys for delivering a really nice add-on to pix insight and with that introduction let's go to it um mike and dave uh, however you're going to present your stuff go ahead start presenting tell us who you are what you did and Tell us how to do it. Well, thanks a lot for that uh, high praise, Eric. Uh, the, the, I'm, I'm blushing. That, that was that was very nice of you to say. Well, you can't um, disappoint us now, Dave. No, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name's Dave, and my uh, I'll, I'll let Mike introduce himself. But we've worked together. We came we came across each other on uh, on uh, the internet there. And uh, um, I had a bit of a method that I wanted to try on, on stretching, and uh, Mike had uh, the skills to, to put it into, turn it into something that we could really use, and we got together uh, that way. Um, but uh, I'm currently coming from Vancouver Island in BC, Canada, just north of Washington State here. Recently retired uh, engineer from the oil and gas industry. And I moved, just recently moved from Calgary, Alberta. And I've been doing astrophotography in earnest for a little over two years now, um, a little longer bit, but uh, in earnest for two years. And I'm currently VP of the Victoria Center of the Royal Astronomy Society of Canada. So that's about me. You're a mute. Mike, are you all muted? Hi. There you so, go. So, um, if I just introduce myself quickly. Uh, so, um, as as Dave has, has said, we we got together. I think it was actually, actually probably Astrobin, which we we first met. Um, I read Dave's very interesting uh, post uh, suggesting the use of generalized hyperbolic equations for for stretching, um, and thought, yeah, that 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 sounds uh, interesting and uh, something I'd like to apply the, uh, my, my coding to. Um, and that was really the genesis of, of GHS. So uh, in terms of, of myself, like Dave, actually, I'm fairly recently retired. Um, and fairly new to uh, astrophotography, actually, but had an interest in, in uh, astronomy for, for many years, but actually 
getting out there and, and taking pictures is, is, is pretty new for me. I've been doing it for about 12 months. Um, so Dave, should I hand over to you to, to sort of kick off? You're muted. Is it coming through there now? Yeah, you're good. Good. Now you're good. Okay. Okay. Thanks to to Tim and Alex and Eric and the TAIC for the opportunity for Mike and I to describe how to use the GHS um, script to uh, stretch your images to the next level clever as we could get. Um, GHS, or Generalized Hyperbolic Stretching, is a methodology and script uh, currently for PixInsight users to stretch astronomical images from linear to nonlinear. So in our opinion, GHS is not just another method or process to, not another method or process to, uh, You disappeared. There we go. Okay. So it's not just another method or process to stretch, but more a one-stop place to customize your stretching transformations. So most of the current stretching functions that we, we found are essentially contained um, within the GHS, only with the only with some additional functionality that GHS methodology brings. Um, the the GHS script is customizable for the image itself and the utility of the image, what you want to use the image for, and your own artistic taste to place brightness and contrast with the addition of degrees of freedom beyond the, the normal amount of stretch and clipping points that, that you are given. Uh, the, the stretch itself is completely repeatable and invertible, it's, and it maintains its data integrity and is non-destructive to that data. So while the formulation is different, GHS uses transforms and equations widely used, widely used in other scientific engineering and economic fields uh, to describe and forecast natural processes. And uh, they are particularly adept at these points at showing dim not nebulosity, bringing that out in your image and being gentle on stars. So while this is based on uh, sound math, Mike and I will try to keep the math out of tonight's presentation and focus on how and why it works. So for time reasons, the slides that I'm going to show are designed to contain more information than I will describe to you, but you can review them later if you wish. But don't be alarmed if we skip over something you see that we didn't mention. So other than that, I will be describing some overall concepts and describe an initial stretch. Then Mike's going to take over and give a live demo of the script in action. And I will follow up some additional concepts for secondary stretches and some examples of how others have found success with the script at this time. So overall, the GHS script contains several secret weapons, if you will, that it brings to the stretching battle, and we'll be describing them uh, as we go along. If you're new to astro imaging process, astro image processing, you should not you should not fear. You don't necessarily have to use all of all. Uh, all of the options that uh, Mike has included in the script and uh, and he has actually endeavored to simplify the process within the script itself. If you are an experienced uh, processor, you might need a couple of tries to at GHS to get the knack as it were, but you will likely find that GHS addresses some of the stretching issues you may have had in the past. Oh, and have I mentioned that uh, well, you must have a PixInsight license. Uh, the script itself is entirely free at ghsastro.co.uk. So I'm going to first talk about the, the first secret weapon that I think uh, GHS brings to bear, and it is, a, is my creation of a comprehensive interface that he's going to demonstrate for you later. But most other stretching functions contain only one input parameter. The, that's the amount of stretch that makes you use of a predetermined transform um, that takes the design of the stretch, I think, away from you somewhat. So in contrast, GHS uses up to five. Um, that's not to intimidate anyone, but uh, as, as you will see. But 
to help you set these slider inputs, you're presented with an environment that shows you what the images look like uh, before the stretch as a preview, as well as a preview of after the stretch, what the histogram looks like before uh, and after uh, as a preview, and even what the transform itself looks like. So all of these things are zoomable and directly inquirable, and the results can be transferred from one to the other with simple push buttons. It's like being at Mission Control Center, Command Center, so you can stretch the image just the way you want to. So after all, isn't that what uh, partly what we're after in this endeavor, the ability to show the images, our images in the way we want and to convey what we want. So the first secret weapon that GHS brings is a, what I think is the most comprehensive and interactive stretching environment that I have seen to allow you to perform simple stretches or to whatever expressive level or detail you want. Page down. There, yes. So uh, I'd like to take about a, a word about histograms. So one of the earliest pieces of criticism, earliest pieces of criticism, constructive criticism I had when I was uh, imaging um, was uh, included really good advice to keep your eye on the histogram when stretching an image. So uh, as a result, we've uh, made the histogram figure fairly large in the use of GHS. And I just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page as to why, what it is and why it is useful. So I'll start off by saying, if you, if you can imagine an image up in this upper right corner, um, created out of uh, using poker chips of different colors as, as pixels, you might be able to, to get quite creative as this image of, of Mario sort of suggests. Now, if I was to gather up all the poker chips off this image and stack them, maybe I want to start playing poker, you would see that the height of the stack of each kind of chip would uh, represent how many of those chips were actually in the original image. So what you can do is the same thing with an, an actual astro image, is um, stack the number of pixels of various different brightness, and here we've got a brightness scale along the, the horizontal, and you can see um, how many of the, how many pixels of what brightness were, are used in this image. You can see most of the pixels, as the biggest stack, is down here at the dark end of the spectrum, and that's really representing the background. So this slide is, illustrates roughly what you'll see in terms of a real uh, image after uh, uh, a real linear image um, after after pre-processing and loaded into PixSight and uh, into the GHS script. So this is the image right here. So it's a nice image. Eh? Uh, of course, you can't see anything because um, uh, this is uh, still a linear image. This one is, happens to be of the Hickson 44 galaxies. So all you can see right now are four of the brightest stars in the image three of which are oversaturated and suffering from a little bit of blooming, as you can see. The histogram that represents it is to the, uh, is to the left and is also indicating the same thing. If you look closely, you will see that almost all the pixels are stacked on the far left of the brightness scale, um, the scale going from 0 to 1, and that's what I'll refer to the brightness scale as from now on hugging the left-hand side. So these are pixels representing those vast dark areas um, in the image and lie within an area that I call area one on the histogram. And this is uh, really, uh, it's a bit subjective of where this area exists, but it's really representing pixels that are too dark to really make out, at least in detail. You see also there's a blip of pixels off to the right. And uh, this is, uh, the brightest stars in the image, so it's right on the brightness side, in an area called A3. Now, you can readily see them all right because they're so bright, but you can't make out any details or contrast. They're just too bright to make out any contrast. So what we're striving for in stretching is to actually put the subject matter of our interest into this area two in the middle where we can readily see things and, and, and make, make, make out what's, uh, what's going on. But this is what makes stretching of 
astronomical image is so challenging is because in native linear form, we are generally presented with most of our pixels being too dark to see, with the exception being pixels representing the brightest stars that are too bright to make it any contrast. So how do we brighten these dark pixels without making the brightest, brighter ones worse? Before I get to the GHS script itself, I just want to uh, introduce a couple more more concepts because to help with visualizing the histogram, um, if you haven't seen one already, I would like to introduce you to the concept of a log histogram view. It is just the same histogram, but the stack height is plotted on a different kind of scale. So I would like you to imagine that the linear histogram that we looked at before represents a sort of a, a skyline view of a city uh, um, as viewed from a distance, maybe on a hill or something, or the introduction to a TV show or something. You can clearly see the skyscrapers in the, in the city, but you can't really see the smaller buildings, maybe one, two, or three stories tall. If you really want to see the makeup of the city, you have to go down to street level in the middle of the city and look up. And that's kind of analogous to this histogram view of the same thing. It's actually the same data as up here. It may be a little harder to make out precisely how tall the tallest buildings are in, in comparison, um, but you can clearly make out the smaller buildings that actually make up the city. So the pixels that are used less frequently in, in the image. So think of the log histogram as going to the street view of the image in the city and looking up at the pixel stacks. So unlike the linear view, the logarithmic view shows the relative stack heights of not only the background, but also the pixels that make up the image. Note the gentle, almost uh, constant slope that you see here uh, towards the right. The small undulations represents some of the smaller details in, in the image. So as we'll see, this kind of log view histogram can be um, become an endpoint target of our stretching exercise for this kind of image. I tend to use the logarithmic view much more than I do the linear view because it conveys a lot more information. So going back to our uh, loaded in linear image, this time using a log view histogram, we can confirm that most of the pixels are in area one, i.e. that's too dark to really make out. On the other uh, right-hand side of the histogram, we can see that those of the brightest stars, even in this linear image, we can see the bright stars start to, start to stack, indicating we have to watch this area starting to jam up on the right-hand side here. So we're going to have to watch this as, as we do our, our stretches to make sure we don't uh, make the situation worse and bloat our stars. We can see, however, that there are pixels of intermediate brightness too, um, just not currently very numerous. And there is a lot more contrast in the image than, than linear uh, view would have resulted. So having, so, these will form the highlights, these intermediate will form the highlights of our subject matter. So we want to watch these too. So the other view of the histogram you might be interested in is the zoomed in view of the histogram. So zooming in on the left hand side of the histogram into the dark area, if you can imagine here we're zooming into just this left hand portion. Um, we can see that the histogram peak isn't actually hugging the left hand side. And actually, most of the pixels have a non-zero brightness. In fact, there's actually a rise to the peak and a fall off to the peak, which you can't see in, in the zoomed out. And now, by zooming in and using the log view, we can actually see this is important information that will actually make up, uh, actually make up our image. Um, all we have to do is to make these pixels brighter by shifting them from the left-hand side in our area one into our viewable area two here and increase the separation between these pixels, increase the contrast between these pixels so they take full advantage of the wide area two, uh, full width of area two, and don't all appear the same brightness. So in other words, the goal of stretching is to move the histogram peak to the right or move the histogram to the right uh, equivalent of brightening it, and to broaden it. Um, and that is the equivalent of adding contrast within it. Okay. The histogram plot area within GHS actually plays a double duty here. Not only does it show the histogram, but it also 
the stretching transform as controlled by the input parameters you select. And I don't know if I mentioned it, but I, I think I asked you to ignore that red line that, that was dying off through your histogram views. Well, now we're going to address that red line. And in fact, the proposed transform that we have is actually, at any given any set of parameters, is actually the red line that's drawn. Um, when first opening GHS, you will notice that the stretch amount, which I'll refer to as D from now on, but it's the first parameter, is set to zero. And that really means no stretch. It so happens when this D is set to zero, then what we call the identity stretch, shown as the red line going diagonally from 0, 0 0.00 to 1, um, um, is, uh, is what is shown. And that is known as the the identity stretch. So the re way to read a proposed transform is to, you can go horizontally to the current, any current input pixel value. You go up to the proposed transform, and then on the left axis, which shows brightness, in this case from 0 to 1, you can read the output pixel value that this will uh, achieve. In this case, the output will be exactly the same as the input value, and uh, the image will be will be unchanged. So um, for the, the, the when we do change the transform, you will see that a second histogram will appear representing the transformed histogram preview after brightening. So the histogram area will show three things. It will show the input histogram. It will show the, the preview of the output histogram. And it will show the proposed transform um, and really, it's performing triple duty in that case. So there's a lot of information being con conveyed in that area. So the simplest way we can stretch we can do with the script itself is a linear transform. It's not a, actually a GHS transform. It's a linear transform, which can be picked as a special option. So this allows you to simply pick a, a white and a black point if you, uh, uh, if you if you really do want to click your data, it's there. But I'm just using it here to illustrate what happens when you restrict something to a, a, a straight line, a linear transform. So a linear stretch is achieved by picking clipping points, a white point, where above a certain input value, the pixels will all be made white, and a black point um, clipping point, where anything with an input pixel value below that point is given zero brightness or completely dark. So note that from experience, I will only execute this uh, stretch with trepidation because on the log view, I am clipping or potentially losing a fair amount of data. You can see all this data I'm, I'm clipping and, and losing. But I d can span most of the data, i.e. The, the histogram right below the histogram peak. And you can see from the, the, the zoomed out view that my new histogram, I've achieved what I want. I put the histogram within that area two area two region. I can see it on the linear side too. Um, and I've widened it quite a bit. So any pixel value in here, you can see will be brightened quite a bit. And here's the result. We can actually make out what our image is kind of what of what it is of. Um, you can actually make out the galaxies in Hickson 44. But uh, yuck, I hope you agree this is a pretty horrible. Not only have we lost details by clipping, but we've simultaneously blown out the center of our galaxies. They appear white. Um, and we've also brightened the flaws in our image. Um, you can see some flaws here. And uh, even the background's got a, a bit of noise in it. Um, so. Uh, you can argue that I could have picked better clipping points, but the fundamental problem is that our eyes don't see linearly. So we've learned long ago that we have to go on some nonlinear stretching, brighten the background a little, um, the middle parts of the histogram a, a bit more, and the brightest parts of the image only a little too. So it's definitely not linear. So this nonlinear type stretching is precisely what GHS does when you increase that uh, stretch amount, the, the D factor above zero. Um, it's what uh, other um, stretching algorithms tend to do too. The stretch transform is no longer a straight line and hence the term nonlinear. It stretches pixels either near zero, zero 
both at the dark end or at near 1-1 at the bright end, the least, and somewhere in the middle, the most. The curve, sh curve shown here is for the default values for everything in GHS and by applying a, a D stretch amount equal to 1. So there's two ways to look at the transform um, before we do the actual stretch. The first is in terms of brightness. Um, and I'm illustrating this on the top. As I showed you earlier, you can read the output brightness off the left-hand side for any brightness on the horizontal scale. Um, the, for example, I go to 0.58, um, form the transform, that pixel will have a brightness of 0.77. The level of brightening going on can be seen from the amount of deviation we have from the original identity transform. Recall that this increase in brightness that is this increase in brightness that shifts the histogram peak to the right. Down here we have the second way of looking at the transform and that's in terms of contrast. Here the steepness of the transform, if you can imagine this is a hill in profile maybe, and the steepness of that hill is how much, is how we are redistributing um, contrast. Where the hill is steep, we are adding contrast. Where the hill here near the top is shallowest, here's where we're, we're uh, removing contrast. Now, unlike brightness, as we can make all the pixels as bright as they can be if we wanted, we have a limited amount of contrast that we can impart in the image. That's because the transform has to end up at the bottom of the hill, which is at zero, and end up at the top of the hill, which is at, which is at one. We, so wherever we are adding contrast, we, somewhere, we're actually taking it away from somewhere else. And that amount of contrast is the relative steepness of the curve. And recall it is this contrast that actually widens the histogram, uh, the area under the hist histogram. So we need to both brighten and widen that histogram area. So for this transform, we added contrast most in the darkest area and least in the brightest area. So let's conduct this nonlinear transform to our Hickson 44 image using only the linear histogram U, full scale on the left and zoomed in on the right hand side with increasing D down the page. So when moving down, we can see that when we increase D, we actually push this, uh, well, even in the first image, we've got uh, uh, our minus D of one, we can see we've immediately pushed our uh, pushing our histogram, here's from the input data, and here's from the new transform data, we're actually pushing it to the right. Well, that's one of the things we wanted to do. As we increase our D, we actually push this curve up towards the upper left-hand corner. And, uh, and what this has done is we're starting to see widening as well as moving to the right of our histogram. Now it's widening because we're putting a steep slope right where most of our data is, right on the left-hand side. And then finally, when we um, increase D to where, where we really want it to be, it actually looks in the zoomed out view like it hugs the left-hand side on the top of the plot. But we can see by zooming in that that's not so. It still has its curved shape. It's just pushed far into this corner. Um, and we've actually pushed the histogram right off the right-hand side of the zoomed in view and right into this area too, and it's nice and wide. Sorry, I got a little thing that sort of snuck into my slide here. But it's it's right into the the, the area too where, where we want it to be. So let's execute this and, and see what we get. So here's the initial linear image. Here's what we did by linear stretching and clipping. And here's our exponential stretch. Um, under this banner exponential stretch as performed by the GHS uh, banner, uh, the GHS equation under the exponential banner. Um, because mathematically, this is the kind of stretch that the GHS produces when the stretch intensity, which I haven't introduced you yet, but I will shortly, that we call B, is set to its default zero. But the point I want to make is that by using this nonlinear type of stretch, we can create a better image, a much better image than the linear stretching can do. We can see way more details in the galaxy. The stars are far less bloated and the background is left essentially in the background. 
So while this is much better, we can do better still. So now I'm going to get to more of the secret weapons. So I alluded to this uh, D factor. It is actually our second secret weapon that I'm showing here. Um, because we can use this B factor, we call it the local stretch intensity in the script. It's also known as call it stretch focus. We called it for for a while. Um, uh, mathematically, it's the hyperbolic uh, exponent to the equation. But what what when we change B, what it does is change the shape or the curviness of our transform in a prescribed way, and you have to look closely at the regions of the transform, but what happens when we move B from its default of zero all the way to B of one, stopping halfway in between at a B of 0.5. If you look closely, what you can see is as we increase B towards one, we're actually reducing the amount of stretch that's taking place in the brightest um, two thirds of the histogram area. So this is where our stars are normally residing in, in our linear image, and we're actually lowering the stress, making it closer to the identity line as we increase B. In the intermediate ones, we're actually getting a little bit more heavy-handed in the stretch, because remember the stretch still has to go from zero to one. And then close to where most of our data is in the far dark side of the, the histogram, we're basically leaving it alone. So when we go from B to zero to B of one, what happens is we end up being much more gentle on the stars while stretching the, most of our data about the same. And it is this B of one, of har it's called a harmonic stretch when B is equal to one. That is essentially the basis for the popular histogram transform or the STF in PixInsight. And it is indeed not a bad all round stretching function. However, GHS can do a lot better than that, I think. Um, I, maybe I'm dating myself, but uh, like the band Spinal Tap with GHS, you don't have to stop at one because we can actually go to uh, 11. We can actually go to 15 in the current uh, script. And as this slide suggests, when B is increased above one, this, the, the shape continues to, to morph. And really what happens when B is increased above one is we start to really intensify the stretch in the darkest areas near this origin value. We're getting much more steeper here. Um, we're getting a little bit gentler slope in the min intermediate uh, region, but we're leaving the stars basically alone. So we're not getting harsher on the stars. In fact, the actual opposite is being true. Because we're intensifying the stretch near our data, we can use a lot less stretch amount to actually stretch that dark data the same, the same, to the same degree. What that means is that stretch amount is actually being even gentler on the stars. So this is where the, the, the secret of really bringing out that dim stuff, widening that, that uh, histogram um, while not, um, while being gentle on the stars, that's where that, that comes from. So I'm quickly going to show you another secret weapon, and this is the third parameter that's in the, in the set. So we talked about D, the first one, and the, the local stretch intensity of the B. This is the third one. It's called the symmetry point. So uh, GHS, uh, most other stretch processes, allow you to only move the point of greatest contrast, which is the point of greatest slope, tends to be right at that zero point for all the most of most of all the stretching. Um, routines. It, it only allows you to move that to the right by performing clipping. However, GHS actually allows you through that SP factor to, to place that point of maximum contrast addition wherever you want. And it takes to, makes use of, a, of a, a bit of a symmetry trick. Uh, but here you can see when we're doing our initial stretch of our, our Hickson image, you saw that the histogram is not on the far left-hand side. So by placing it, our SP point right where the histogram peak or close to where the histogram, histogram peak is, we can uh, put more contrast right where that peak is and not waste it 
back here in the in the dark area. So remember that we can't really inject contrast into the, the total image. We can only redistribute it. And in this way, SB allows us to maximize the contrast and place it right where we want it. So I'm going to switch gears here, and then uh, let's talk about an initial stretch and how I might uh, we might conduct one using that SP uh, using that uh, SP and the the D and B factors and how we might set it. So this is a, a recipe that uh, I I tend to use. Um, you might come up with your own variant on this. Um, so I I uh, generally try to pick. Uh, an SP just to the left. I zoom into my histogram in linear mode and I pick an SP just to the left of the histogram peak there. And, and Mike's going to show you in a second how that's done fairly easily. And then I um, stretch the image using a fairly aggressive B factor. I actually put this one all the way to the right. And then increase my D till I can actually see the histogram in my area too. And I can make out the image fairly closely um, in in my preview and I what I tend to do then is pick an, a point it's not very contrasty this image but I can make out what's actually in my data and I generally pick a point um, that uh, I really want to separate background from foreground subject matter and here I picked you know the edge of the, the, the galactic uh, atmosphere if you will so then I set SP to this value. And immediately when I change that SP to that value, you can see it in, the, in this figure is actually SP has ended up to the right of the histogram peak. But immediately upon doing that, the, the, the histogram of the, of, the, of the preview will change and the image itself will change. And this is what I get as soon as I pick that SP value. And uh, um, what I can now see is actually pick that maximum contrast between that uh, galactic uh, atmosphere, if you will, and my background fairly reason re reasonably. When I look at the plot area, I will see that I've achieved what I want, but the but the atmosphere itself seems rather flat, and perhaps I'm, I'm removing too much contrast from the rest of the image and putting too much at that SP level. So what I can also see in my histogram is I've actually caused a bit of a bifurcation um, in, in it. I've actually created a second histogram peak. And that's also indicating we don't really like this. This doesn't really generally look good. So I may have um, overstretched or put too much contrast at that single, single um, spot. So maybe I should consider um, just backing off B or, or D a little bit. So when I do that, I, I will adjust B or D. If, if you didn't have any bifurcation, maybe you're fine. Maybe you want to increase B and D a little. But for this uh, image, um, I uh, just backed off my B, uh, my B and D a uh, little. I backed off my B to 6 and my D down to 5.2. And what I end up with is a histogram here that kind of uh, illustrates what the kind of shape, and I'll talk about this more in, in a few minutes, what kind of shape I'm after on the log histogram. I've got my peak from my background in, in my log histogram view, and then I kind of settle to a monotonic decline towards the right. Um, I check my stars out. I really haven't bunched my stars too much on the right-hand side. And I think that's reflected in, in, uh, uh, in the image. So, when I'm reasonably happy, then I execute this stretch. And I think you would agree that this is the best one I've shown you yet. Um, the cores of the galaxy are just right. We can make them out uh, nicely. Dust lanes look good and contrasty, and the stars display a range of magnitudes. And at the same time, the image flaws aren't brought to the forefront. They're still there, but you are not brought to the forefront. So at this point, I'd like to turn it uh, over to, to Mike, who will give you um... uh, David, before you start, maybe uh, I don't see any questions over on the chat, but I have a, a question. 
in working with the GS, GHS stretch, there seems to be nothing more important than trying to establish what that symmetry point is. And initially, yes, yes. And it is a matter of how much background you want to bring out. But you right. can you can correct some of the background noise that you might bring up, and it might also have some information there that you don't want necessarily blacken out, as a lot of people do with their images. If you make it black enough, you can't see the flaws. Um, it, it, do you know of any right or wrong way to position, or is just a matter of feel where you put that symmetry point uh, relative to the histogram that you've default stretched? Yeah, it, it, it's so image dependent. And, and I, I'm going to address this after Mike gives a, a quick demo. Um, it's not absolutely critical. So you can, you can fix, as it, as it were, any, with subsequent stretches, any sort of thing you realize after doing your initial stretches. It's, it's nice to get as close as possible on your initial stretch, but, but your, your data is all there. Um, and, and anything can be um, um, redone as well as undo. There's of course an undo, but you, you can redo. And, and I, I do, um, I do uh, also encourage exploring um, a little bit for yourself. Like, uh, Take the same image and 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 try something else, and and it might highlight something different in your image, that uh, that you might like more or or, or something. But uh, I'm going to talk a little bit after. It's not critical that you get it absolutely right, um, but it in, in this case it was deciding what do I want the subject matter to appear as, and and that's why I picked sort of the edge of this galaxy. Um, as sort of the dimmest part that I really wanted to look at, and I wanted it separated from the background. And, and that's how I picked it in that case. And it really depends if you've got nebulosity that sort of covers your entire image, you might be well left of the histogram peak for your SP value. If you've got an image such as this, that the subject matter actually occupies a small portion of the image, and most of your image is background, then you'll tend to be uh, on the right-hand side. Of, David, of the, now, are um, you going? I got one more question, uh, Terry. Are you going to address um, maintenance of star color in any of this? Yes. Yeah, we 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 uh, will we will address it. Um, maybe best to go on to the, the, the demonstration well, because Eric. I think Terry has a to... Terry has a question. Why don't you let him pop in? And... Uh, David, at what what point? Does the data go from being linear to non nonlinear? Is it after the very first hit of that button on the on the tool? Yeah, unless you're doing a linear stretch, then of course you're you're keeping it linear. Um, and and linear just means that the, the the absolute brightness in in ADUs or in on your zero to one scale is additive, right? So you can do superposition things like deconvolution. Um, whenever you want the brightness to be additive in your overall image. But as soon as you go to nonlinear, it's no longer uh, strictly additive. Something that is twice as bright in your image didn't have necessarily twice as many photons hit it than, uh, than Well, um, let me, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, Terry's question may be, until you actually punch the button to create the new image, it is still a linear image. You haven't destroyed, as you say, it's non-destructive. You haven't changed anything while you're adjusting all these curves within right. the script. Right. It is and, still a linear image. Yeah. And, anyway. and as long as you record, because it's a mathematical transform, as long as you record those five parameters that you're setting the transform, you can just invert whatever you do and you go back to your linear image. Not approximately, but, but uh, exactly uh, within digital fidelity, of course. But, but, uh, and, and while we're chatting here, there's a question that comes up in the chat. Let me just read it by uh, 
Emma, what is physically happening to the image when there is a bifurcation of the histogram? Is the quantization error re induced? Are we trying to generate too much contrast uh, where there is no data? Well, you're actually um, on the histogram, the pixels will try to run away from or separate at the point where you're putting the most contrast. In. So what, you, what you're doing is adding too much contrast at a single point. So you're pushing any pixels that are um, slightly brighter than your contrast point. You're making a lot brighter and any pixels that are slightly darker at your maximum contrast, you're making a lot darker. So uh, I think that will be addressed, hopefully, in the remainder of the presentation, when I get to refinements. Now, okay. if you get that by, you can repair it, but it's a lot easier if you don't recreate it in the first place. All right, let's, let's go. Okay, so um, moving on then just to the demonstration, if I can try and share my screen with everybody. Hopefully uh, now people can see my screen. Yes, yeah. we can um, see M51 there. Out of that's great. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so uh, let me just start with um, practicalities um, because I think it would be useful for people to be able to see um, how to get hold of this script uh, in the first place. Uh, and the easiest way to do that is to um, go to resources, uh, updates, manage repositories. And you'll see in there the list of uh, the standard PixInsight repositories. You may have already added some others of your own, uh, but the one that you want to add is this https uh, forward slash forward slash www.ghsastro.co.uk forward slash updates. Um, the add button here, put that URL in there, click the OK button, um, and then that will add that to your repositories list. And then you need to go again to resources, updates, and then click this check for updates. And that will then go away and check to see whether or not there is uh, an update for you. And there isn't for me, of course, because I've updated it already. Uh, but this should then come up with a message to say that there is a uh, an update waiting for you. Uh, and then you just click OK to, to install that. And you'll need to exit Pink's Insight and come back in again in the normal way that you would um, load any new uh, Pink's Insight update. And that will get you. Um, under script utilities and then down here generalized hyperbolic stretch and this is the um, the interface that you will be presented with um, I will demonstrate some of the principles that uh, Dave has just been talking about um, and in, in a practical sense through the script using the, the image that you just saw of, of M51, which um, is not one of my own. That is actually one of uh, Dave's pictures. So thanks very much to him for, for sharing that. Um, the first thing you need to do is uh, here in this panel um, here, you need to load the image that you want to work on here, it's M51. You'll be, it actually has a, a screen transfer function applied to it at the moment. You'll be asked if you want to keep that or not. Um, I'll keep it. Uh, it doesn't really make a difference which way you go. Uh, whichever way you go, the preview that you will get within GHS will not have the um, uh, will not have the screen transfer function applied. So I've now loaded that image. Um, the areas of of, of the uh, script to focus on up here, we've got the the histogram jammed right over onto the left-hand side because it's a linear image. We've got the, the stretch transformation. Um, down here, we've got the transformation parameters. 
And then over here on the right hand side, we have got the, um, the image preview, which again is not very interesting because it's a linear image, so it's, it's just dark. Now, what I can do is, um, what I, I tend to do is, is really just, first off, um, move the, the stretch factor across until such time as I can actually see what it is I'm working with. Um, so there is, is the image of, of, of M51. It, it's a stretch, um, but obviously a very bad one. We've got a huge burnout in the center of the, uh, the, the galaxy there. We can do an awful lot better than that. Um, now, let me just, uh, this, this button here will zoom the histogram right in. So this is the predicted histogram of once we've applied the stretch. But what I really want to do is I want to look at this um, data down here, which is the unstretched data. And I can zoom right in to see all of that by that zoom button. Now, broadly speaking, the sort of area from the, the far left-hand side through somewhere into the histogram is background. Over here, we have got... Um, interesting data. This is um, data which uh, corresponds to the the actual galaxy itself. And somewhere between those two, there is a crossover point, which is not well defined, um, but broadly there's going to be a crossover point as we start to move away from predominantly background into predominantly interesting data that we want to, to reveal. And that's the, um, the point that we want to put, the, the SP um, point. Now, because this is uh, an image where um, most of the image is actually background, uh, we've just got a smaller amount, which is, which is subject matter, I would expect that that point is going to be to the right of the histogram peak. That is to say, the majority of this, these histogram pixel counts are uh, corresponding to uh, to um, to background, but the way to to find that um, we've implemented this readout control. So I can click anywhere on the his on the the preview, um, and that will give me um, a readout reticle. Uh, the average um, pixel value within the square of that reticle is given up here. Um, and it also echoes that average value where that appears on the histogram. So I can, I just click and drag, I can zoom in to the preview um, and I can move that square around and get a feel for what, at what value do we start to move from sort of background, which I guess is down here, up into something which is um, corresponds to data that we, we really want to reveal? Um, and that is showing a value round about point triple zero nine. It's um, this gold line on the on the uh, the histogram. That's probably the number that that would make a good starting point for my symmetry point. So I can either type in the point triple zero nine down into this box down here, or more conveniently, I've got a little button up here, which allows me just to send that value immediately down to the, the symmetry point. So if I now reset that zoom and I can reset the zoom on the, on the histogram, um, that's uh, set my symmetry point. Now, what I want to do, actually, I'm sorry, let me just go back in here. You'll see that what that's done to the um, uh, to the transformation graph is we have now got um, the maximum contrast. There's, there's a, a bit of an inflection point going on in there, but it's not much of an inflection point. What we really want to do is to to pull in a much stronger contrast in at that point and typically you're probably going to be looking at something in the sort of eight nine ten maybe even slightly higher uh, level for that uh, stretch intensity um, and that will then get you to an image which looks 
something like this. And of course, the, the um, galactic center is now um, really nicely preserved. The stars are nicely preserved. Um, this is looking much more, um, uh, much more the, the, the sort of situation that we want for our first stretch. Um, so if I just come straight out from that. Um, so that's probably uh, as, as good as anything for, for a first stretch. Now, what's, um, what I don't like about this, uh, probably two critical, two key things. Um, firstly, it's pretty monochromatic across the entire image. Um, and secondly, it's pretty flat. Um, the second of those issues I'm going to address with my second stretch. Um, but the first of those issues is something which I can address right now uh, with this initial stretch. It's a, a feature of, of really all um, hard initial stretches. You get it with histogram transformation as well. Um, that uh, that initial stretch tends to bleed color out of um, your basic data. Um, there is a process um, within PixInsight, the, the ArcShine process, which a lot of uh, users tend to use uh, because it tends to preserve color. Um, and it's not actually the, the ArcShine um, equations that are preserving the color it's the way that those equations are being used within the stretch that's preserving the color um, so what we've done here is we've allowed that same process of, of using the equations um, in what we call the color stretch over here um, but we're using still using the generalized hyperbolic stretch equations if i click on the color um, option you'll immediately see that um, color sort of almost magically jumps into the image. Um, as I say, it is because of the process that's being used to apply that stretch. Um, so that's probably quite a nice um, first stretch that uh, does what I want in terms of preserving color um, and also preserving the, the stars and, and the galactic core. So I can apply that by clicking the, the green tick down here um, what I'll actually do is I will create a new image rather than overwriting the data on the existing image. And there we go. By default, the script will um, choose the new image that you just created uh, and make that your new target view. So now what's happening is it's reapplying a further stretch on top of that. Um, so if I just use this little button down here, I can reset the parameters and get back to where I was expecting to be. Um, turning to the log view that Dave was talking about earlier, um, this is uh, looking from the, the, the streets of the city up at the buildings. We can still see that, that actually we're, we're keeping things quite nicely controlled up here where the stars are. We're not blowing things out too badly at all. It's not a bad sort of downward stretch. There's a little bit of a hump going on here. Um, but, it, but overall, it's, it's not too bad. But the thing that we don't like about this, this stretch um, is that it's the, the really very little contrast across the, the image that, that uh, is of importance to us. So the way to do that, again, we want to try and find uh, a symmetry point. So let me zoom in on the, on the image. And again, I can just click on the image. I can move my reticle around just to get a feel for what the, the values are out in these sort of spiral rings, which is where I want to add the next bit of contrast. Um, and, and maybe you know, something like this, somewhere in the sort of 0.418. But it goes down as far as you know, these 0.35s and up into the sort of 0.5s almost. Um, but something like that is probably not a bad symmetry point to go for. Interestingly, that just happens to correspond with this hump, which is something that we want to try and um, stretch out. And that's no coincidence. That's really, this is the, 
um, the histogram um, demonstration of, of the lack of contrast in at that point. So let me send that value to the transformation symmetry point. I'm going to reset the zoom. Um, I want to, uh, the, rather than the, the very intense stretch that I had for that initial stretch, I want this one to sort of spread out around that area. So uh, maybe a value around about the sort of three level. Um, and then start adding that stretch factor in. And very quickly, we can see that actually the contrast is now coming right into that galaxy. Um, so maybe something in that sort of always tends to be a little bit of a a dance between the various parameters, but maybe something along these lines gives us the the, the stretch that we're looking for. It's also flattening out quite nicely that um, lump that we had on the histogram. This is now giving us the nice sort of downward. Um, trend within that, um, with, within the, this, the transformed histogram. One of the things that it is doing is um, throwing the background quite dark now. You see that actually that histogram peak is now being pushed to the left. So there's another um, parameter that we can use, which we call the shadow protection point. What that does is um, to the left of the shadow protection point, we will make this um, uh, transformation just a linear transformation. Um, so if I start pulling that into the situation, you can see that actually we, we can get to a situation where we've actually got the identity transformation down here. So we're not really changing the background at all, uh, but we are still creating that extra um, uh, contrast around the the galactic arms, so maybe something along those lines would would, would do us fine. Um, and what tends to, I, I can apply that. The the way that the, the, this tends to work um, is a bit of a dance, really. You 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 do um, reset that. So you, you do your initial stretch, it's going to be pretty flat. You look at where you want to try to get the next bit of contrast, do a stretch to try to get that contrast in, and then work your way around the image, um, adding contrast in the areas that, 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 that you want. So uh, you know, typically there'll be you know, three or four more stretches that you might want to do on this to try and get to your, your final position. But this, the basic principles are always going to be um, similar to the ones that, that, that I've just talked about. So I won't go any further on any of that. Um, just before I leave the uh, script, just to point out a, a few extra things, there are quite a few different transformation types available. The histogram and arc shine stretch are, are both there, but uh, then they, they are basically the same as uh, in within the sort of Pix Insight uh, processes of the same name, except that we've added this sort of additional functionality of symmetry points and shadow and highlight protections. You've got a straight linear stretch, um, which can be useful, but of course, with a linear stretch, you 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 are always in danger of of destroying data. Um, image inversion is fairly obvious. Image blend is not so obvious. Why would we put an image blend? Um, transformation type in here. Um, the motivation for this was actually, whereas on this particular image, the color stretch did quite a nice job and got color in uh, quite quite well into the, the galaxy. Sometimes what you'll find is that actually the RGBK stretch leaves you with a bit of a washed out look, but the color stretch leaves you with an almost cartoon like look with far too much color in there. What the image blend uh, transformation type will do is allow you to actually blend a little bit of one into the other. Um, and the, the blending percentage allows you to sort of dance between um, the, the amounts of each that, that, that you blend together. And that can give you quite a nice um, sort of midpoint um, stretch. Um, there are various other different stretch types up here. So you've got, um, you can stretch just a single channel, red, green, uh, or blue. Um, you can stretch just the luminance channel. 
and you've also got the ability to to stretch the the saturation so that that would allow you just to sort of pull a little bit of extra saturation into your into your image if if that's what what you wish to do down here we've got a number of um, different sort of option buttons there's a um, a link straight out to a dedicated website uh, which is quite useful because we've got on there a number of um, tutorials um, this uh, hopefully this this um, will also be linked in due course uh, we've got links out to various uh, forums where there's some interesting discussions which can be quite helpful um, to, to uh, further um, share experience um, I, I sort of feel like this the um, the GHS script is, is a, a little bit like a, a child um, I, I sort of brought it into the Dave and I brought it into the world and we, and we gave it life um, but it's now out there and it's making its own friends and it's uh, doing things which um, uh, you know we never thought of and uh, constantly surprising us um, so uh, really seeing that the um, the experience of, of, of experienced images and how they're using it has, has been very very rewarding um, there is uh, a comprehensive documentation available on uh, within the script worth knowing about the preferences dialog where you can change the look and feel of the of the script and also how it behaves you can change the, the size of the preview so that's that's a the dialogue worth knowing about and investigating and all of the stretches that you undertake are recorded in a log which you can save out to a text file so that you know exactly what you've done um, if you wish to do that um, this little button down here will just turn off the preview which allows you just to see what's what's underneath which can be handy from time to time um, and then this X will get you out of the script uh, I won't save my log. So, so we have some questions, and if you have a few minutes of both of you. Far away, absolutely. Um, yeah, I wish you wouldn't have closed that. Can you open that up the way it absolutely. was? Absolutely. Okay. And bring up that image. So you've you've got an RGB image, but normally in processing and Pix Insight, you're working with the RGB at least separately in the beginning, or perhaps completely separate, and then the luminance separately. So yes. a lot of the the final color will depend on your luminosity image, and the color image. I don't want to say it doesn't have to be perfect, but you strive to maintain color as much as possible with RGB and then count on your luminosity image in order to bring out the highlights. So a lot of what you've done here is, is maintain it as if it were a final image, which when you add in luminosity, it's not. And it's highly, you know, what you get is highly dependent on the luminosity. So do you have any way of bringing in luminosity to see how that might look uh, as, as you might do in PixInsight once you close that? No, it's, it's, it's perhaps a, a really good suggestion, though. Um, practically, when I you know, usually do things to your luminosity that you don't do with your RGB color, and even the data starts uh, out a little bit different. So it would be nice to um, perform, to, to think of an ideal world where you perform the exact same stretches on your RGB as you do in your luminosity, so that you get um, everything in the, the exact same place, but that that doesn't happen. So yeah, we have... we never tell uh, the RGB what we're doing to luminosity or vice versa. We, it's it's a secret. Well, so, yeah, we do have a couple of questions, you know, that are on the uh, over on YouTube. Let me see if I can read these off. Are there any scenarios where the RGBK stretch is preferred over color for the first stretch? That's from Hema. So um, just on that, I, I think go, going back to, to what I was saying before, that actually sometimes that color stretch can be slightly overpowering. 
Um, so you, you might want to, to, to do both uh, and then sort of take a, a blend of, of the two. Um, the RGBK stretch will, I mean, it, it, it's inherent in the way in which it works that it is always going to bleed out the some of the saturation which is implicit within your original data whereas the color stretch will always maintain that saturation level and and that's what you really want to do you want to mean you can even oversaturate a little bit on the, the rgb because your luminosity will take care of it and that's really what the arc sign stretch will do is sometimes the arc sign stretch images are you know cringeworthy but when you put on your luminosity you still maintain a lot of color which is what you want and yeah. linda asked uh, did using that color stretch apply two stretches at once rgb and then i'm not quite sure what she's saying but another no, time no. or was it just one stretch that occurred it's basically it's just one stretch i mean the the, the diff the diff basically the difference is that um if when you do an rgb K stretch, um, each of the red, green, and blue pixel values is stretched independently. Um, so because they're obviously diff well, <laughs> unless it's gray, are going to be different numbers. So they're going to be stretched by different amounts. Um, whereas within the, uh, and, and it's because of that differing amount of stretch, that is what bleeds out the, the um, uh, that's why the saturation gets bled out of your image. So the way that the color stretch gets around that is it is basically just takes the average of your R, G, and B values, and then it calculates the um, the stretch that is implied by that average value, and it implies that same stretch amount to each of the three channels. And in that way, you 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 maintain both the the the, the hue and also the saturation um, of the image. And Zach has a, another question. When I use a GHS script, I sometimes get washed out contrast. How would you best add contrast to the image without blowing out details? I've only used it a few times. I think you kind of covered that, Mike. When you go back and and do a second yeah, and third stretch. If we have time to go back, I, I will be, be talking about that. If you look at the LP and HP factors, what you essentially do is you put the contrast where you want and the amount you want with the stretch factor and the B and the SP. And then as you raise LP towards SP, what it'll do is it'll brighten the entire image. So just like Mike showed you, that's restoring the brightness. So, so you can actually brighten the image. Um, and then HP is the reverse. As you move HP down from one towards your um, SP value, you actually start darkening the image. So it's almost an independent control over lightness that you have between SP, between LP and HP. It's Did you want to demonstrate that, David? Yeah, I, I've got a few uh, I mean, slides. We have that a few more minutes. Go ahead. Um, I think I need to. Do I need to stop sharing? Yeah, you need to stop share. Um, okay. I'm gonna work out how to do that. <laughs> um, You're on a Mac. I don't know how you. There you go. Stop. Stop presenting. Okay. Are we seeing anything? You are presenting, David. Okay. Okay, so look, this is basically where we uh, kind of left off there. But I just want to talk, we, like, we talked just about galaxies, but you can talk about. Uh, other things too, and, and getting that overall shape. Um, and I took a lot of this from, from SharpCap, so, um, which is where I spotted all of this. So just 
I'm just briefly going to say this before answering your question. Um, um, if you look in the SharpCap documentation, the SharpCap, I, I love that, that program. I, I don't generally use it for sequencing, but for everything else, I, I use it. But it's got some really good material on the shapes of the logarithmic um, histogram that you might get. I know this one's labeled solar, lunar, planetary, but it's also for if uh, nebulosity occupies a, a big portion of your, but not all of your, your image. And finally, if you've got maybe a starless image or even one with stars, that like nebulosity occupies the whole thing, then you should be going for that shape. So if you can see here, this is applying a second uh, stretch to the stretch we already have, because just as, as the example Mike showed, you have, you have a, a lump there um, uh, at these low values, and it's really adding um, contrast within this, this uh, galaxy core. So what you want to do is you want to put your SP value where that contrast you want to add, and you put add some D to it, and you add uh, SPs right on top of where you want to add that contrast, and a reasonable D. But what you'll see is what that's done is it's moved the, the background to the left. And this is with an LP at zero. So if I increase LP and I start moving this up towards my SP value, you can see I can actually raise that bottom end. You can see that's actually dimming here because this, the transform is below the identity line. So that's making that image darker. So when you raise it LP, you can actually raise that background um, and brighten the image somewhat. And I can actually go a step further. I can raise LP all the way up to my SP value. And now I can see I've actually brightened the whole image. So I can even see the, the background is, is quite a bit brighter. Um, so, so in this example, I'm using LP to, to brighten the image and and, and and do that sort of thing. But you do the opposite with, with HP. So here, I after I do that stretch, I found another little hump that I want to get rid of up here on my log histogram. So I put my SP at that value. And you can see if I zoom in on the right-hand side of my histogram, you can see I've actually moved these peaks representing some of those brighter stars, there's some peaks there, and I'm actually moving it to the right. And you, and potentially, you could be blowing out your stars in that case. So what you should do is keep an eye on your stars in this point, and if you see you're blowing out these bright things, then you can move HP down from its base level of 1, start moving it down towards SP. And in this example, I've used LP and SP at the same time. And this re-darkens the top end and avoids that that blowing out. Right? So what you end up with is almost almost independent because they are somewhat independent, uh, somewhat dependent, but almost independent way of putting the contrast and brightening and darkening the image as a whole. So hopefully that that helps. Okay. Uh, I, I can continue on and I, just finish off with a few examples if you like. I don't know how much we're doing. For uh, sure. If there's more to share, go for it. Okay. All right. Well, th this first image, I sort of made a comparison as the best I could do with the arc shine stretch here with minimal clipping and here with maximal clipping. And then the same thing with the histogram transform, trying to do the same. Now, the problem with the arc shine stretch is it <laughs> tends to, to bring out the background too much in my view, um, more than I particularly wanted in this image. And I can only cure that while well, getting the contrast where I want. I can only cure that by clipping. The histogram transfer tends to blow things out a bit too much. Um, and I can improve that situation somewhat by using the histogram transform within the, within the script and applying uh, SP, LP, and HP. So this is what I can do with the histogram transfer on without clipping. And then finally, I think is the, the best one is the is the one I did and just illustrated with 
with GHS. So that's the cores are, are really visible and contrast within the stars. And this is just to illustrate that when I do clipping, I'm destroying data. However, within the GHS image, really my data is intact. Right? Uh, that ability to invert the stretch actually exists within the script too. And then uh, another example, and, and often we get this, this is by someone on uh, Ann Howe who commented on uh, Stargazer's Lounge. She was an early adopter of GHS and she um, took this image, image of M13 and uh, compared the stars between, again, um, Parkshine stretch and histogram transform. And she also uh, looked at mass stretch uh, as well. Um, and, and some people think, but I, I think the GHS stars are still the best. And mass stretch comes first and, and comes second, I, I would say, if I'd be so bold. But um, a lot of people think that GHS is doing some sort of mass stretch. Well, that's, that's not the case. The, the mass stretch is actually applying a discretized, explicit formulation to stretching. Um, and uh, that it gets you close. But one thing it can do is because of that discretization, the way it works, you can start to see some artifacts within the stars uh, itself. So, um, and, and for this image in particular, it's important not only to get the contrast between the stars but since there's only stars in this image you want to get the contrast right within the stars and this was uh Anne's, uh full image on on astrobit and i've got a few other pretty pictures i'm going to go through real quick by some other early adopters of ghs here's uh one by a gentleman called randy lindstrom um he's got uh, a great image bringing out the ifn in and around uh, um, in and around Bode's galaxy that he attributes to uh, partially attributes to uh, GHS to bring that that out and also a monochrome chromatic starless image of uh, hydrogen alpha in and around the horse head and I love this image because uh, you can see all the details of, of, the, of the, the hydrogen nebulosity and then some other galaxies this one uh, by Linda, she actually has her own website as well as posting on, on Astrobin. And I, I just love the amount of detail she's got. Even in the smallest galaxy she's been able to bring out. Um, and another one by her of the sombrero. And when you look close, you can see all the, even at the oblique angle that you're looking at this galaxy, you can see a lot of the dust lanes uh, in, in between. Um, so, so I, I would check these uh, these images out. Oh, finally, uh, a few by Scott, who's a fair, who I haven't actually met in person, but is a fellow Vancouver Islander. Um, and here's an example of a, a nebulosity incorporating the entire frame. And he's been able to keep the, the stars so so tight that it almost takes on a, a starless look to it. But the star the stars are in fact all there. And, uh, and another of his of uh, uh, sunflower galaxy, capturing both the atmosphere and the details within the galaxy itself, uh, quite extraordinary. So thanks for letting me finish that. Did I answer the question originally? Uh, yeah, I think you did in a little bit more. This is fantastic. So guys, thank you very much. And we ran a little longer, but I think that everyone listening or reviewing the this video on YouTube will probably be switching over to the GSS, GHS stretch in PixInsight. I know I, I already have, and I've learned a few things tonight. Uh, probably wasn't doing it perfectly, but well, well, we'll go back and redo our images again. Well, if I'm brutally honest, Eric, um, when when Mike and I first created it, we sort of looked at each other and went. Okay, so how do we tell people to use it? <laughs> we don't even know ourselves really yet. So, um, Eric, did we get all those questions over there? Yeah, there I might think have we been did. some. There might have been some added while you were looking at uh, the others. No, I don't see anything.
Okay. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mike and Dave, for being here tonight and, and turning us on to this this uh, new script that you guys have worked up. Uh, I really appreciate your your effort in doing it and the volunteerism. We rely a lot on volunteerism here on the Astro Imaging Channel, and I really appreciate it when I see guys, you know, taking advantage of that. So uh, we'll be back next week with. Um, our year in review and two big tutorials for everybody out there. And the week after that with um, Richard Wright coming in to tell us how come guiding needs to die. Remember, we are always looking for presenters. And even though we did get a lot of volunteers at AIC, we still need more. So please sign up. And I guess we'll see you next week. So uh, by Jerry, the way, guys, you can hang with us afterwards after we close the uh the online session so you don't have to go if you want okay before i close off for tonight i want to say um you know last week we were up in san jose with uh, who all was there eric tim um wanda and did we get everybody no nope, there was more toga 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 was there and uh we really appreciate there was a there were a lot of people came up and and thanked us for putting on the show and stuff like that. It is a labor of love and it's a lot of fun, but, uh, and you know, we do a lot of it for self-satisfaction, but we really appreciate that you appreciate it and um, hope that, you know, you're part of the extended family and you can participate in this, volunteer to do things for us. Come back next week, we'll tell you a few ways you could volunteer. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Terry, you're in charge tonight, so take us out.